There's a passage in John McPhee's Coming Into the Country where he talks about people who go to Alaska with their minds made up that they're going to live out in the wilderness, get away from the corrupting influence of society. And he said there tend to be two types of people who don't make it. The ones who decide that they're going to live the way the Indians did, with nothing modern, no modern conveniences at all. And the others who try to take on too many modern conveniences. The ones who survive are the ones who are sensitive to what's actually needed in any given situation and what's available. So they put aside their preconceived notions and learn from what works, what doesn't work. They learn by trial and error. And they learn not to let abstractions get in the way of seeing what's actually happening. This is an important skill that we have to learn as meditators as well. Because on the one hand, we do need to study the Dharma. Even the forest of Johns who talk about learning from your practice and not getting tied up in books, still they had to study from some books to begin with. To to know the Vinaya, to know the basic teachings. If they didn't pick these things up from books, they had to pick them up from Dharma talks. So there's an extent to which you have to learn the Dharma in the books. But then there's a the skill of applying it. And that requires a lot of subtlety. Remember, we had a, an old man who came to us after he'd retired. He'd been a maha, which means that he'd studied, in his case, seven years of Dharma studies. He'd passed the seventh out of nine Pali exams, which was quite an accomplishment. Then he disrobed, became a layperson, and got a job in the government. Then when he retired, he came out to stay at the monastery. I remember John Fuang talking about him and saying that he was a very, had a very coarse understanding of the Dharma. He had no subtlety at all. Which I found really interesting. That too much study can make you coarse. It can blind you to the subtleties of what's going on. And so the Buddha talks about not only knowing the meaning of the Dharma, but he talks about six other types of knowledge that you need as a meditator. It starts with knowing the Dharma. Yeah, that's number one knowledge. Number two is knowing the meaning of the Dharma. Now some of this comes from asking questions, from thinking things through. As I say, you, you listen and then you think it through. But then in order to really understand the meaning of the Dharma, you have to develop the Dharma. In other words, what are the skillful qualities in the mind that need developing? You develop them, and as you develop them, you find they teach you about them. You learn about them through the developing aspects of them that you didn't realize before. So here we're moving from what in the old days they called scribe knowledge into what's called warrior knowledge. Where it's not just knowledge in terms of definitions, words that can be written down, but it's gaining a feel for things by putting them into practice in difficult situations, just situations that challenge you, where it requires a sense of balance, a sense of circumspection. And what are some of the other things you need to pick up? in these situations? Well, one is a sense of yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are you capable of? If you're in a group of people, what's your position in the group? What's a 
appropriate behavior for someone in that position. What work you still need to do in training in virtue, concentration, discernment. In other words, being very realistic about where you are. Not getting depressed when you find that you've got work to do and not getting puffed up when you realize that you've mastered something. Trying to be very matter-of-fact about the whole thing. That in and of itself is an accomplishment. The second type of knowledge you need is a sense of enough. In external terms, this means how much comfort is enough to practice, how much is too much. How much do you have to put into a particular task? And this requires realizing okay, what task you're doing right now, exactly how important is it. There's that saying that anything worth doing is worth doing well. And that has to be qualified. Because if doing it well means you're taking time away from other aspects of your practice that are more important, then you've got to cut back. To have a sense of just right. Because if you go beyond just right, it becomes wrong. No matter how right it may seem in terms of your ideas of what should be done or what's, what's meritorious or whatever, if it goes beyond just right, then it becomes wrong. So you've got to be careful. We like to have the monastery really nice around here, but there are times when putting too much work into the monastery becomes a mistake. We like things to be clean, but sometimes we go beyond just clean to just really, really spiffy and really nice, and that's when it becomes an obstacle. And John Lee talks about how our thoughts of goodness sometimes become maras, become obstacles on the path, because we get fixated on lesser aspects of the process practice or externals at the expense of internals. The word what in Thai means both monastery and your duties in the course of the day. And the duties here can be either internal or external. John Fuing would often say, don't let the external what get in the way of your internal what. In other words, the concerns of making things nice outside, nice food, nice places to stay, nice whatever. If that starts getting in the way of your meditation, you've got to cut back. So you have to look all around you. As John Lee would say, you have to have eyes on all sides. To gain a sense of proportion of just right. The next form of knowledge is having a sense of time. This is also time and place. What's the right time to be a warrior? What's the right time to take on a battle? What's the right time to stay away from the battle? A lot of us who decide we want to become Dharma warriors make the mistake of just taking up every battle, seeing that we've been weak and passive in the past, and it's time that we got a little bit stronger, and then you just burst into any area and say anything. It's like those old encounter groups where people were encouraged to overcome their inhibitions and just say whatever came to them. And of course, it was very destructive. There's a time and a place for different things, and you have to be very sensitive to what is the right time and what is the right place. What's the right time to take on a particular battle? What's the right time to avoid it? And John Lee talks about living in the forest and learning lessons in avoidance. Baby chicks tells a story about the monks were out one day and they found all these baby birds on the path. And the baby birds, as soon as they saw the, saw the monks, I think they were baby quail. The mother gave a sharp cry and the baby quail went running into a pile of leaves. So John Lee had them. Some novices take a stick and stir the pile of leaves to see if they can get the baby quail to run out, and they wouldn't. 
they made themselves into little baby leaves. That way they avoided detection. And he says, as a, as a teacher, as a monk, you have to learn to take a lesson from those baby quail. We think of a John Lee as quite a warrior. He had the heart of a lion. But he also knew how to have the behavior of a baby quail when necessary. So don't think that when you become a Dharma warrior you just want to take on every battle that presents itself. You have to figure out which battles are worth winning, which battles do you have a chance of winning. And if you find out that you're losing, how do you get out? This also relates to a sense of enough and a sense of yourself. Which battles are you capable of taking on right now? And how much effort are they worth? And we can talk about this in general principles, but in terms of learning the details, you have to learn from trial and error. This is why the job of a teacher is not just to give Dharma talks, but to notice when someone's getting out of line and to point that out to them. John Mahabho makes a comparison with teaching boxing. He said, you see your students leaving an opening for the opponent, well, you hit them right there to show them that that's an opening. You've left yourself exposed. It hurts. And as parents always tell their children, it hurts the teacher more than it hurts the students, even though the students don't believe it. But it has to be done. And there's a sense of people. First, there's a sense of when you enter with a particular group of people and they're engaged in a particular kind of activity, how do you behave? So many of us have the attitude of Popeye the Sailor Man. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. You maintain the same personality and the same demeanor in every situation. But the Buddha wasn't Popeye. And John Lee talks about how the Buddha was able to behave in different ways in different, with different groups when he was talking with old people, he would make himself like an old person. When he was talking with young people, he would speak like a young person. I noticed with this with a John Fu. He had some young students, and it turned out he knew some young Bangkok slang. And they were surprised. They didn't know he knew it, but he could use it rightly. Created a sense of connection. There are times when he'd be very quiet, very withdrawn, extremely modest. Other times he'd be very talkative. And he began to realize it's not a question of just expressing his personality, but having a sense of what was the right time and the right place. Who were the people that he could joke with? Who were the people he shouldn't joke with? One of his favorite stories was the one about the the swans and the tortoise. The swans would fly to this lake, and they struck up a friendship with the tortoise living in the lake. And they told the tortoise about all the things they had seen, flying north, flying south. And the tortoise got very envious, thinking here he was just stuck in that little lake. He was never going to see anything more than just the lake and the shore. And here the swans were seeing this great wide world. So we mentioned this to them, and they said, oh, it's easy, we can take you up with us. And so they found a stick, and the swans, the two of them, each took one end of the stick in their mouths, and they had the tortoise hang on to the middle of the stick with its mouth. And they flew up into the air. And the tortoise, even though he was hanging there by his mouth, with his eyes on the side of his hand, he could see a lot of the world he'd never seen before. But they happened to fly over this group of children. The children called out, oh, look, swans are carrying the tortoise, swans are carrying the tortoise. tortoise got angry, felt that they were making fun of him. And then he decided he had a smart answer. He was going to say, no, it's the tortoise carrying the swans. 
As he opened his mouth to say that, of course, he fell down and died. It's a lesson John Fuang drew from that. It's when you go into high places, keep your mouth shut. Look, observe, and don't try to show off your knowledge, because sometimes it'll kill you. So he had a very strong sense of time and place and who he was with. That was part of being a good Dharma warrior. And then the final knowledge is learning how to evaluate other people. We often hear that the Buddha taught us not to judge others. In fact, I was just reading the other day a supposed quote from the Buddha in this book called Teachings of the Buddha. The first part of the quote is actually from the text. And the Buddha says that the karma and the results of karma is one of those things you just can't think about. In other words, you can't try to figure it all out because karma is so complex. But then he goes on to say, Therefore, Ananda, one should not judge others. If one judges others, one destroys oneself. That whole passage beginning with therefore and not as total fabrication. The Buddha did talk about judging other people in terms of how skillful their behavior was. And the purpose of judging them is to look back on yourself. This is what skillful behavior looks like. Can you do that as well? This is what unskillful behavior looks like. Are you doing this? This is what it looks like from the outside. Do you still want to do that? If we judge other people just to pass judgment on them, that's, that's not what the purpose of judging is, is we want to reflect on ourselves. So we do look outside, but the looking outside is with the purpose of looking around inside to see what work needs to be done. And we look outside to look all around us to make sure the situation we're in is a situation we understand it to be. So we can learn how to apply our knowledge of the Dharma. So it's not just scribe knowledge, it becomes warrior knowledge. We have a sense of what the different teachings meaning, <clears throat> what the different teachings mean in different contexts, what we're capable of, who we are, what is just right in this situation, what's the time, what's the place we're in. Who are the people we're with? And as we look at other people, what lessons can we learn about our own practice? Because that's where the real battle is. It's inside, doing battle with your own defilements. And John Mahabua compares it to being in a boxing ring. You've got to knock out your defilements. And John Lee talks about actually learning how to convert your defilements to your side. Both approaches are right. Again, there has to, you have to have a sense of time and place. When can you convert your defilements, and when do you really have to knock them out? That's how you become a skilled warrior. That's where your knowledge of the Dharma and its application becomes complete.